So former commissioner, um, Mr. Gary Griffith, he is a tremendous gentleman. I was telling Pro that this man gave his life to the Lord earlier this year. His son did it last year, and he was so inspired and challenged by the change in his son's life. And the bottom line is that his aunt is Pastor Katian Samaru. She is um, she and his mother are sisters, really. And the bottom line is that she has been a great influence to him over his over his life for years. As a matter of fact, um, the previous commissioner got a prophetic word concerning his life in the future that really made him think twice as to what he should do with his life at at this point in time in this season of his of his sojourn, so to speak. And as a newborn in Christ, you know, I, I told Pro, I am the one mentoring him. That's a joke because um, at the end of the day, this gentleman loves to hold his head up high and let people know that um, he bows to no one but God. He believes in truth. He loves truth. And for whatever is God's will for his life, he's all for it. He's locked into a prophetic word that he got while he was at Sister Katia and Samaru's. Um, did I pronounce that name right, Pro? Katia and Samaru, right? Yes, 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 yes. Right, good. That's making sure I'm not um, um, saying the wrong thing. But the bottom line is that um, he's locked into his future right now. That's the point. That's the point. It took a while for him to decide if he should go this direction or not as far as um, um, making his life the life that God wants it to be. And that's the only way I could describe it, bro. Meaning that mm -hmm. um, I've been around him while he was still commissioner. And after he was commissioner, to encourage him in the Lord, um, knowing when he actually got baptized as well. But to deal with a Christian perspective of nation building is a challenge, I know, for the Christian community. Because we as a church generally, bro, as you very well know, we do like politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I could dare say, we don't like politicians either. Pro, you know me too, I'm a plain talking, so <laughs> expect plenty of that. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> having this goodly gentleman to us tonight is welcome to you, sir. Um, Mr. Gary Griffith, former Commissioner of Police of our nation. And it's an honor to have you on with us tonight in Jesus' name. Thank you very much, Pastor. It, it, it has been a while. Um, I've, I think it's, a, it's a, about a year or two since I last have been on this station. It is indeed an honor. And it, it, it's, it's good to be back on after a few years. Okay, so welcome, welcome, um, Gary Griffith. Uh, well, I was almost said, do, the, do, you, do you all still carry um, or refer to um, your rank? your former rank when you were in the defense force. In other words, are you still Captain Gary Griffith? I, I don't know what the protocol is. <laughs> well, yeah, there, there, there's so much debate about that. Now, usually after you, after you, unless it is that you resign or you're dishonorably discharged, mm -hmm. if you have a service commission appointed by the president, you keep that rank. Um, you, so it's still referred to as, that's why you'll have Captain Arthur Cipriani, um, the previous president of the Jamaica Football Association was Captain Horace Burrell. So if it is that, and I, I did not, um, I got an honorable discharge and I left after 17 years service. So persons can refer to me as a retired captain. They could, re sometimes they refer to me as retired senator. They could call me anything they want. But you all could please feel free to call me Gary. Yeah, well, I was not, I was just about to say that because the whole nation knows you as Gary. So if I step and say Gary, <laughs> you know, you know, you'd excuse me. Anyway, let me let me start off. Um, well, I already started, but let me continue with, with, with Pastor Ian Brown. I want to ask this question as we, we kick off. Um, now, there, there ought to be, uh, as far as I know, a, a separation of church and, and state. All right. Now, you, we are talking tonight about rebuilding the nation, nation according to the um, biblical Christian perspective. And uh, you said just now, Pastor Ian, that people don't like politics and politicians. That's because most people think that, you know, you don't mix, you don't make politics and the church. 
you don't mix you you can't be a, a, a christian and a politician that's the general that's that's the, the 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 perspective a lot of people have so i want you to tell me um what role the church has to play then because if there's supposed to be a separation of church and state and if most people think hey listen christian shouldn't get in, involved in politics at all boy how is it that you want to bring this together pastor brown talk to me okay you're muted huh? so all right okay okay so we open now. yeah mm -hmm. well i'm a firm believer in the scriptures i love the word i love the fact that a lot of what is prophesied in the old testament that is to be fulfilled in the new is really before us right now it's really in our face and one of the things i could tell you um and once um pastor margaret lee am i, am I correct now yeah is on the air she'll she'll verify and you being a doctor in theology you know that in acts 15 it talks about god building the tabernacle of david and rebuilding it as it was in the days of old to confirm the fact that there's going to be a governmental structure in the earth where gentiles reign and rule with the same kind of a grace and authority and wisdom that david had and not simply to reign and rule but to ensure that what god does with the church just before the rapture is that the church goes out not limping but with a bang in other words we are really going to be the head and not the tail now that is going to happen that is not going to happen in every nation mainly because god respects our will professor Mm -hmm. And some people will choose to want to honor God by giving themselves to God to fulfill certain things, and some wouldn't do it. And God will work with that. God will work with whoever wants to work with him. There's a beautiful scripture that I love to quote in church a lot, and it says, your people shall be willing in the day of your power. In other words, the day that you want to show off your power, oh God, your people shall be willing. I love that a lot. Where politics is concerned on the church, I tell people about Joseph. I tell them about Daniel. And they were not reigning over Christians, quote and quotes. You know, they were there to demonstrate that God loved everybody. We know John 3 16 very well, you know. But we just don't want to apply it when it comes to politics. You understand what I'm saying? So the point mm -hmm. is this, so even though Joseph did it, and it was a non godly Christian com community, and Daniel did it through five kings from Darius to Cyrus and if you check people check the historic um lineage and the linkages you'll see that that's a five kings of succession so to speak bottom line is that they reigned righteously and the people knew about God's goodness through them so how on earth we could talk about we don't care about politics when there is only one way people could know God's goodness in a general way in a nation and that is if somebody is righteous who could lead the forefront in a godly fashion and right with righteousness so that that's my take on it anyhow yeah but you know i i think what happens is that when people think of politics and they look around and they listen to to politicians and they listen to the the rantings on both sides or all the different sides you know it, it it's always about degrading pulling down shooting down and that sort of thing and that's our image of politics and and that and uh, that is diametrically opposed to christianity in yeah, christianity yeah. love you build you help you you know your brother's keeper and politicians their role is to um make you look bad so that my i could look good my party could look good so that's why i'm trying to see in the, in the minds of the public what does the church has have to do with that because it's, it seems as they're two opposites, and that's the perspective. Well, Pro, you know very well, I am I am deliberately pushing this narrative right now in, um, in my life, in my church. Um, I'm part of the Association of Independent Ministers. Pastor Emile de Boog is the president, but I'm also linked and affiliated to other groups. But wherever I may be allowed to um, share what the scripture says I tell them plainly that for the kingdom to be what God wants it to be you have to believe that Daniel said that the kingdom shall be given to the saints of God and the saints shall possess the kingdom and the entire kingdom is going to be ours to control like it or not you'll be a politician 
I'm, I mean, for, for, I don't have a nice way of saying things like this, yeah? But like it or not, you will be a politician. Once you're born again Christian and you're full of the Holy Ghost and you're going to be serving Christ and taking up when Christ comes up for his people, the bottom line is simple. You shall reign with him. And the people, according to Daniel 7, shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom that has been given to them. So the kingdom of this world shall become of the kingdom of our Lord and of its Christ. And if God is going to give us some practice before that time, well, well, the church should say amen. I know, I know some churches they don't like to say amen. I, I tell people if they don't want to say amen, when I come to church, it's because the ushers told them don't say amen and Pastor Brown come to preach today because they have something mm -hmm. against them. But um, they should say amen. Mm -hmm. Right? Because that, that, that is really where we are heading. The church must be made to be aware as to where we are heading and what is we call a Christian perspective of what is called a biblical way of building a nation. Because unless we know that and really believe that we have the answers, well, when I say that, I mean, from what the scripture tells us, um, the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. But I have told the church for decades, I, I don't like that scripture because I always believe that Jesus says, if a lack wisdom acts of God who gives liberally to all men and he upbraids not because wisdom has one objective and the only objective that wisdom has is to be in, you, in such a full way that God governs the nation or community through your life. So people who don't understand the value of what it means to be building a nation as a Christian or involved in the building of a nation as a Christian I'll tell them, go to professor's church. He'll teach them something. And um, you'll do a good job in helping them through in Jesus' name. You think so? All right, if you say yeah, so. Yeah, you'll have 100, 100 more people coming by you by tomorrow. <laughs> All right, if you say so. Let me, let me ask Gary. Gary, do you, do you believe that this nation could really be run using um, Christian principles, biblical Christian principles? you really believe that this, this country, I'm talking about Trinidad and Tobago now, because you're Trinidadian and you, you know what is going on. You're involved in politics and you're involved, um, you know, also at the level of, of um, national security and that sort of thing. Do you really believe that that can happen? Yeah, Professor, definitely. It must happen. There's, it, it is not an option. It is not negotiable. And um, when I speak about that, you see, I, I know there's that concern about politics. But, in, but when you look at the meaning of the word politics, politics has to do with governance. Politics has to do with serving. And that actually filters down whether it is a company, whether it is a school, whether it is a church. And apart from using the word Christianity, I mean, I would like to use the word religion to persons not to be to, to perceive that whether it is you have another faith outside of Christianity. The religion is so critical towards good governance in a country because the same way that in religion you have good, there is evil. And evil plays a very big part that you will see in politics throughout the world. And that, that evil comes about. You would have seen the evil where it is like for myself, where I would have spent as a commissioner of police, there were 43 death threats on me. Evil was trying to kill me, kill my family. And I was doing what was required as a servant of my God to serve persons. And the end result is there would be persons and they still do, would have done everything in their power to try to destroy me because evil will always try to, to destroy good. And that is why it is politics is so important because if the persons who are, political, um, who are political can understand the value of religion, many of the things they do, they would not be doing as it pertains to corruption, um, trying to hit, uh, trying to divide, trying to be racist, trying to destroy. All of those words are evil that you will see in religion of persons who try to turn to, to that part of, of evil. If politicians try to understand the value of good, the value of, of religion being there to serve your God, how could you want to serve your God and you're doing things that may be corrupt or trying to deliberately arrest political opponents? And even as it comes to, to national security, what we saw in Arima, that was evil. Hmm. When I was commissioner of police and minister of national security, I understood the importance of getting citizens, if every citizen could have that fear of God, then you would not do what happened in Arima. And that is why I, as a commissioner of police, if I am to be a servant of my God, it started from my early teens when I actually went to, to service with Pastor Dibug and then my whole family, 
um, from Reverend Margaret Lee and Jesus is the answer in Diego Martin, my whole family, um, they, they are heavily involved in the Christian community uh, and, um, and they, they serve their God, they are servants of their God. My concept is if I am here to be a servant of my God, I will use politics as an avenue. And sometimes I use me as being a commissioner of police because if certain if individuals who are evil do not have that fear of God, I decided for them to have that fear of Gary to ensure that the law abiding citizens could be protected. <laughs> I like that. Okay, um, folks, if you've just joined us, you're listening to Men Talk on Isaac 98.1 FM. The promise we have in studio with us today, uh, Pastor Ian Brown and uh, and uh, Gary Griffith, former commissioner of police, former minister of national security, and now politician. Let me just bring in quickly my co-host, Ricken, who just joined us. Ricken, good evening and welcome. Hi, good evening, Professor. Uh, good evening, Adesola, and of course, our esteemed guests, Pastor Brown and Brother, Brother Griffith. Welcome to you, sir. Great having you guys. Looking uh, forward to the continuation. Okay, so, so, so Pastor Brown, where, where, do we, where do we start? We talk about rebuilding. Rebuilding means that something has been broken down and uh, we need to get the structure back up. So where... Where where do we start the rebuilding process? Okay. One of the things I love, bro, is history. Okay. I love the fact that we have a lot in the scripture to tell us about the past, but much more so about our future. And I'm really locked into the fact that what God said in Amos 9 from verses 11 to 13 is that God will build again this structure as it was the days of old amongst the Gentiles. In Acts 15, that is where you hear James, the apostle, telling the rest of the apostles, he says, this Gentiles being saved with a sign of God starting this rebuilding for governmental structure where he could reign in the earth through Gentiles. And when you hear the excitement of the apostles when this was being stated in the book of Acts chapter 15, you, you wonder how come it took so long before? You know, we get the point. Well, I always believe that a lot of things that Jesus said up front early were meant to be fulfilled in this time. For example, he, he would say, um, you wouldn't have gone through more, um, all of the cities of Jerusalem until the Son of Man comes. But you know what happened, all right? 2,000 years have, has gone by. Then you'd also see things like, there's some of you here who will not taste of death until the Son of Man comes. But guess what happened? Almost 2,000 years have gone. And you, you know what going, went on, right? They all died. So mm -hmm. a lot of what was said by Jesus was meant to be fulfilled in our season. That is in the time where everything will bear fruit according to what it really is. And if a church is what it is, as far as God is concerned, mm -hmm. not simply a giant, but the, the young ones of the lion of the tribe of Judah, well, yeah, we're going to come up to scratch in quote and quotes. So when we want to look strictly at scripture to see where this is going, there is uh, there, there are quite a lot of scriptures fit. And like I said, thank God you have your doctorate in um, theology because you could verify what I'm saying. But for those who are not aware on this men's talk, I'm telling us plainly, we are going to have to make contributions on this topic because the wisdom doesn't just lie in two or three people. The wisdom of God lies in the church. And that is why as long as you all are willing to say, I believe this is going to help this nation. I believe that is going to help this nation. Because between me and you, Professor, I tell you the truth. I am ashamed of our politicians. Mr. Griffith is not yet a politician. All right? He is a young Christian who is vying to be a tremendous politician. And when that time comes, he'll be the best of all. I'm prophesying, okay? But right now, he's the young man in Christ who is leading a party, seeking to get the minds of the people to understand one thing and one thing only. And it is this one thing. It's not about one people. It's about everybody benefiting from what God has in store for man. When God says he is good, 
he lets the rain fall on the just and the unjust. You see, we Christians know too much scripture, but we don't know how to apply the too much scripture. That's all that is really our big major problem. But when we come back again to seeing what we are required to fulfill for those who are willing, my, old, my whole point is this. I'm not willing to be a politician. All right, just get it clear, okay? I'm willing to support God's narrative of righteousness when the person that God says is fit to be the leader. And that is my stand and take on the whole thing. What, what I know we're going to do, God knows how long we're going to be at this topic, um, be it one night, two nights, three nights, but the bottom line is this, we're going to learn scripture. We're going to get inputs. Because at the end of it all, when, okay, I, I, I love history, like I said before, but when you look at it all and you begin to realize that you have templates of what um, a government is like for the US or the UK or for Australia, and you hear at which point in time they began what is called nation building. Um, in 1947, for example, in the US, they began by having a special act put in force and in that act, it was supposed to be dealing with the issue of national security and nation, nation rebuilding through security agencies that were trained to actually deal with nation building and not just gathering intelligence. So when you understand that they have templates out there that literally were designed to guarantee that the, legit the legitimacy of a nation is secured by the way you could deal with a structure that could both build a nation and defend a nation, that is what I'm hoping that will be thrown out to the public so we'll understand you need somebody who has a military mind to see this thing good on good. And I'm not saying that because um, my good friend is here tonight. I'm saying this because I've been saying it for years. I have told people pro for years. I, I told them the best Christians should be people who are in the defense force or who are military people because they should know what discipline is. They, they were drilled to be disciplined. Christians lack discipline. And that's why we have a problem with our Christians being out there in the political field because they lack discipline. But I have said it for years, in our assembly, we have a few guys who are in this field or that field, but I can tell you one thing for sure. Discipline is something that I don't play with, meaning that according to the professor, he'll say, um, um, live right, I will say walk straight. Okay, and that's the narrative. Don't call yourself a Christian and you don't walk straight. So pro back to you. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. I'm still trying to make the connection though. Um, how are we gonna get is it that okay, Christians are supposed to form a, put, a, a, a political party? Is it that um we have because we have Christians in all the in, in the in the various parties, right? And uh, so I'm still trying to because we're talking about rebuilding a nation here, not rebuilding a party, rebuilding the nation. Now, when 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 Mr. Griffith was talking just now, he was talking about people, he was talking about good and evil, good over evil. How do we find the good people? How do we get them into these places and spaces of influence where we can truly say that this nation is governed by good people? Because one particular party is made up of people of one many different religion many different races all these things so there's there's so much diversity how do we bring unity this is what i'm trying to understand how do we bring unity to a nation how do we get people who would put trinidad and tobago first above their own personal um their own personal gain where are we finding these people from how do we recruit them how do we get them is it that I know Mr. Griffith is the, the leader of a, particular, uh, of a political party? Do you say, well, for you to be a member of my party, this is the criteria, um, and, and I must see that you know, there are these qualities in you? Or is it that anybody could join? I, I am I'm just trying to understand. Eh? 
I'm trying to make sense of this whole thing. All right, maybe Mr. Griffith could, 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 could answer that. How do we get the people, the right people in the right places to govern, or right places to, of governance, places, um, position of authority? How do we get the right people there? Guys, I'm, I'm trying to understand. So, yeah, Professor, and again, remember, where do politicians come from? They come from our society. So politicians, right. they're a reflection of our society and, and vice versa. When many persons decide to be politicians, sometimes they do it with the right intentions. But you know what it is. When that product of opportunity is there, when evil presents itself and it gives you, you start off and I really want to serve my country. And then you see that all you have to do is to sign something and you could get a kickback for millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And that is where the evil shifts. So you lose focus of the, those three principles, which is why when Pastor Brown spoke about the military, I'm not here to blow the trumpet of the power of persons in the military because they've been good and bad people in the military as well. But that is why it is seen as the most noble of all professions, because that is where it is. You have put your hand on a Bible and you're willing to take a bullet and, a, and give your life for a stranger. That alone sets the tone of you being a child of God. You are willing to give the ultimate sacrifice. It is not coincidental that 31 of the 45 US presidents all had military service. Being in the military, it gives you that understanding that you're here to serve, not just to lead. You're here to be a servant. And when and what is important is we politicians, when they remain as politicians, you have to remember three things. Who do you re um, report to? Who do you serve? Your God, your country, and the people in that country. That is a chain of command. You remember that you are not going to shift towards being corrupt. You're not going to spend your time. Let's try to demonize the other side. Let's try to destroy them. There are political leaders that spend all of their time spitting heat, division, even try to be racist, to divide the country because you want to, you want to win. You want to have that Prado and the security and the big contracts. And you forget, you know, narrow is the part that leads to righteousness, but broad is the way that leads to destruction. And you get all of the fancy things and that is why it is so important that politicians must ensure they keep those moral values, the family values, understanding what you are there for. The day you forget that, you have now lost the evil. And that is why me, even as a, um, I see myself more as a patriot than a politician. When I was Minister of National Security, I stood firm on principle. And I did not become the minister after that because I stood firm on something. When I was Commissioner of Police, I stood firm on principle. <clears throat> there was a a uh, recommendation for me to arrest, have people arrested in their homes. And me, if I wanted to keep my job, keep my work and keep uh, my security, I would have just blindly done that. But then what I would have done is incarcerated law-abiding citizens wrongfully, which is what happened in 2011, because a commissioner of police didn't stand firm to say, we cannot do this. So I will always, I will be prepared to lose my job, lose my life, stand on principle. You stand on principle. You keep those moral values as a politician. That plays a big part towards transforming a country. Okay. I, I hear you. I hear you. And uh, I know, okay, so you're one man. How do you infl how do you get more of you then? How do you get, how do you multiply yourself, Mr. Griffith, to get people who think like that, who say, <laughs> listen, I will stand for righteousness and truth. I will not, because as you said, people start off, um, politicians start off with good intention. But when you see opportunity and the ease as which these opportunities come, it, it, it does something to you. And so, you know, you start off on the right path and you end up on the wrong path. How do we keep them on the right path? That's the question I'm asking. I don't know if that question could be answered, but I, I'm it's, asking it. Yeah, Professor, easily. Um, it, it, is not, it is not impossible, but it is, it is not it is not going to stop holy. There's no way you're going to find a country that is corrupt free. That would be all politicians are good Christians and they will serve their God and that will never happen. But if you put as me being a, a leader, I understand the importance of providing deterrence, taking away products of opportunity to make it difficult for that individual because that is what crime is. Crime is a product of opportunity. The greater the deterrent, the less likely that person would commit that crime because he knows there's a possibility of them being apprehended. So that is what I operated as a commissioner of police. And I did, I tried my best to find ways to serve my country, but it's, it's very difficult, Professor. When I could actually go into a place and find 63 elderly persons in cages, six foot by six foot, some of them naked, their locks are on the outside, they are in shackles, they are teasers. 
and I released them. That was slavery going on in my own country. And then they're all, the persons who did it, they're all released, not, no fault of our criminal, our justice system, but by other individuals who know exactly why they didn't provide the evidence and the data and so forth. Those things must hurt because you know that there's so much evil in our society and, they, and it, is, it is starting to filter out to such a way where we have now trivialized it, we have taken it for granted, when five young persons could be killed in Arima in cold blood. But the big, big talking point is saying enough is enough because we are going to lose the president's ground to play football. That becomes the bigger talking point. It says mm -hmm. so much about our society, which is why I, as a political leader, I will always put country um, before politics. That's why I said I'm willing to help this present government to assist, because when I was the, the commissioner of police that last year, the country felt safer. Criminals, were, they pegged back. They saw the product of opportunity was no longer there. But evil has such power in this country. People who are not religious, they figured it is going to affect my business. He can affect, he can arrest some of my, um, my associates who may have criminal enterprise. It could affect me and my corruption and my kickback. And then their job now is to try to destroy, discredit Gary Griffith as much as possible. Because even though what I'm trying to do is to serve my country, protect my people, evil is there. And it is important for politicians to remember that, for citizens to remember blindly supporting political parties because of the, it is no longer just a cult, here, Professor. It is a cult where they can blindly support political parties, see wrongdoing, know what they're doing is evil, but still support them because. You feel that I am supporting it because of my race or, or, or because that is the way it is. No, it must not. You we must start supporting persons based on right. To support persons based on if that person or those, those individuals can transform our country. And that is my intention. Wonderful. I see Riken, hand is up. Riken, you have a question, comment? Sure, um, Professor. Um, Every politician that is sworn in, you face the polls, you win your seat, or even if you are appointed, they have to swear on a holy book. Most often it's the Bible or the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita. Every single one of them they say something to this effect. I, so-and-so, do solemnly swear that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago and will uphold the constitution and the law that I will conscious, conscientiously, impartially, and to the best of my ability, discharge my duties as whether it's a minister, prime minister, whatever, and do right to all manner of people without fear or favor, affection or ill will. Every single one of them takes that oath of office. My question is, how many really take it seriously? One and two, what are the consequences of not doing so? How do we hold people accountable? Our representatives, do, well, some of them are not our representatives because not everybody who, who is appointed as a minister actually faces the polls. But be that as it may, how much weight do we attach to these vows and these oaths of office that we take before God? And on the day when we have the swearing in, you know, everybody look nice and, you know, we clap and it's like, hooray, congratulations. How many actually know that pledge? How many have it written? Let me end off by saying this. Whenever a king was selected or appointed in Israel, he had a responsibility, among other things, to read the law and to write his own copy by hand. And there was a reason why God instituted that. And we read more about that in Deuteronomy chapter 17. What meaneth these oaths of office? 
if from day one they are violated? Well, That's I'm my question. Sure, I'm not sure who this, who's going to tackle this as part of Brown or Gary. As a, well, it's, it has to do with the with persons needing the import, understanding the importance of values. Values, if it is you lose the values, and again, there's something I remembered when I was Minister of National Security, I did a massive campaign to unify the country. Uh, and you can actually go on it, it's something that is in the United States, it's called uh, values.com, pass it on. And it has so many important values to ensure that a country can build from integrity, ethics, bullying, family values, loyalty. And if people try to keep those values, especially politicians, you stick to those values, it is going to be difficult for evil to actually cause you to shift to the point that you will turn a blind eye and a box train that costs 500,000 you'll give to your friend to do it for $15 million because these things become byproducts of inflation, of, of, of higher, um, more crime taking place, criminal elements getting contracts, purchasing more firearms, more drugs, hiring more gang members to put hits on other gangs. Politicians are directly responsible for all of these things. And it is because they have forgotten those values. The, and, and again, going back to the importance, Professor, of religion, whilst religion must play probably the most fundamental part in politics, is a politician must understand that if you lose those values, you have now forgotten, uh, Mr. Allen, what you just said, you have forgotten that oath in office because you have to remember, when I had my situation as a minister and there was that um, incident, and as a commissioner of police, with that incident with the prime minister, Every time in my head, I kept praying to my God to make the right decision, remembering my values and remembering my oath in office. The day you forget those words that Mr. Allen just said, you have no, you'll start losing those values. And even if you want to start forgetting those values because you want to enjoy and bask in the, in the fruits of the success you can get from being a politician through kickbacks and markup and trying to destroy the character of others so you could stay in power, there's going to be a day called Judgment Day. So even if you are religious, you must remember that day as well, because there's a, you are going to pay the price. So for 20 years or the next 30 years to live luxury, and then for the, and then um, till um, Guy Kingdom come, you are going to have to pay for that on Judgment Day. All of that has to be important in a politician understanding the importance of religion and the importance of values. The day the politician loses that is when it is he should be removed. But unfortunately, we can have political leaders that can kill persons in cold blood in downtown Port of Spain. And you can still have 100,000 people still vote for that party because that is how they have, they have to change that. You have to, you have to put that mindset to know, I must support persons who honestly believe, I believe that they are going to serve. They may not be perfect. I am certainly not perfect. But one, I, one thing I would ensure is that I will swear that oath in office to my God, my country, and then my people. Folks, you're listening to Men Talk on ISAC 93.1 FM. The lines are open. I'm going to ask Ada Sola to give the lines again. As I switch back to, to Pastor Brown, I have to ask um, Pastor Brown a, a question. But before I ask him that question, um, Ada Sola, could you give the numbers again for people to call if they want to connect with us, please? Certainly. Uh, the numbers again are 622-1981, 622-1981, or 628-1981, 628-1981. Or you can send us a WhatsApp. Uh, at two seven five one nine eight one. Right now we have well we don't have direct questions. Actually, we have a call. So let's take that one time. Yes. Hello. Good evening. Um, I want to give a perspective because not to give up anything. I'm I'm not speaking on behalf of of where I work, but I work in a unique place in that, as Mr. Brown said before, I'm a member of the military, but I'm also uh, uh, a minister of the gospel. Mm -hmm. It's something that we often see in scripture, and it's it's that you will see men of uh, pro you will see prophets speak to the king of the day, and you will see that where they have that voice and they have that that ability to speak to those in authority on a regular basis and to bring advice from scripture or directly from God. Here my, my and we're bringing solutions. If you're bringing solutions, one of the first solutions I want to bring in us going forward with that is that we, we as the church should come together 
members of the church come together like there's a, an evangelical council or something and on a periodic basis approach the government or within your 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 counties your boroughs you approach your mp approach the mayor not just to bring problems but to bring solutions on a periodic ongoing basis the second part of it that we're talking about discipline from maybe a military perspective and you know discipline is also a biblical concept is that we need to hold our leadership accountable i am one belief personally that there, there should be some type of a institution for those in high office um who will have to answer um specifically so I'm talking about a prison in a different place for people who are public servants at a high level, specifically, so that you add, because where patriotism is missing, you add a certain amount of accountability that causes people to, 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 be, to be forced into action or to be forced to be held accountable. Thank you so very much, everyone. I'm, I'm hoping that this contributes to also. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Yes, it was. Thank you so much. Um, don't we have an organization that, that deals with that holding those in, in public office accountable? Um, but bef but but I, I, let me before I forget, I want to ask Pastor Brown the question, and maybe they're related. Should we start teaching, talking politics in church? Should we before do we that? Continue, we, we have a mm -hmm. call. Could we All take right, a yeah, let's take the call. Let's, let's Hello, take good the evening. Call. Hello. Hi, good night, sir. Go ahead. Sure. It's Pastor Armstrong. Go ahead. Good night, uh, honorable gentlemen. This is Pastor Armstrong here. Pastor Armstrong, good evening. Good evening to you, man of God. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Go ahead. Uh, quite, quite interesting topic. And... Um, Okay, I think I'm confusing myself because I'm on the line. Yeah, you, you need to listen to listen to your phone. Okay, like I said, quite interesting topic. And um, this uh, position that we are in currently, currently as a nation, I think, one, we have to clearly understand that the political structure has failed us. And it is now creating an opportunity for the government of the church or for the church to take responsibility and rise up in this nation and make the difference. That is the demand. What that says to us is that we have to stop the fragmentation that is called the church and come together united because the, the, the original intention of God, starting from Exodus 20 with the Ten Commandments, he gave laws because he intended that his people would be a model people in the earth. We have failed in from that perspective. And so here we have a situation where the political structure is in stumble and it's happening globally now. And then we have the church that is supposed to have been taking up that mantle and, and restoring structure. We are a long way from that. So that we are in a crisis right now. But the responsibility still is for the church to rise up and make the difference. Is the church a model people in the earth? There's a lot of work to, to be done. So there is need for a restructuring in order to take on governmental responsibility and order because we have uh, the mind of God, we have the wisdom of God, we have the spirit of God. It must no longer be seen as though the gift of the Holy Spirit is just about speaking in tongues. It's about the manifestation of the mind of God and also the wisdom of God necessary in this season and in this hour. I, I, I choose to rest just on those, that basic point for now. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Pastor Pastor Pastor. And, and, and here's the problem with that. The church is so fragmented. I am not sure, or maybe I should ask a question, can the church speak with one voice? Are we not talking about religions now as, as you know, Mr. Griffith or so? We're talking about Christian, the Christian church. Can we speak with one voice? And I was at, going, um, asking the question, of, um, Pastor Wong, should we talk, should we start talking politics in church? Should we start 
uh, when I say talking politics, dealing with the issues, rather than every Sunday we come here, we're hearing, you know, what the word of God says, you have the, the pastors preaching and, and that's fine. But what about the day-to-day -day issues that they same, the same congregation that you're preaching to, they have to go there and face the same issues. They have to face the grocery. They have to deal with the crime situation. Are we equipped to deal with that? Should we start talking about that in church? So you go to church on a Sunday and you're not only hearing what Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and, you know, what it says in that or what God says or when he gave the Ten Commandments, but how does that relate to us today? Should we start talking? I, I don't want to say bring politics in the church, but dealing with the issues within the four walls of the church, and maybe that might make um, you know national politics a little easier. Pastor Brown, what, what are your thoughts on if that? If I could stick a pin right before um, mm -hmm. Pastor Brown, we have a call. Let's take that. Hello, good evening. To the program, to the pastors, and to the former commissioner of police, Mr. Gary Griffith. Yes, go ahead, sir. Yes. Oh, thank you. Now, I've been listening to the discussion. And one of the things we have to understand, the same people in the church is the same people that live in this society. I believe what has happened over the years, I think the church and, and religion would have collapsed. Because long ago, what you had a closeness with the church, the system and everything would have been tied in. So to the end of the day, regardless to how we run away from it. When the people come to the church, yes, they sit in the church, but it's the same people that live in the same society and system. And one more thing I would add, if we did not have constitutional reform, I think everything would remain as is. We have a set of archaic laws, and with that law, the present governance structure will not change. Good program. I thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I know that's the point I was trying to make. That is the same people, the same people that come to church are the same people that have, go to, have to go to the grocery, are the same people that have to walk down Paul, um, walk through Port of Spain and might get robbed. So I am I'm saying, if we are saying that the, the, the government of the day or the politicians are, are, are failing us, should we start dealing with these things from within the church? Pastor Brown. Yes, Professor. I've been waiting patiently. <laughs> sure. have a here, thank God. But I'll tell it like this. I teach politics in our church. Okay. I tell mm -hmm. people politics um, has a background from a guy named Aristotle. And he's the one who coined the phrase, the phrase politics. And that has to do with a specific way of dealing with the distribution of the wealth of a nation to the people. And I put that alongside what is found in the scriptures, where the Bible says they had all things in common. Things that we only hear about in the church. You know, we only want to hear about politics here, but we only hear the Bible as how the Bible's narrative of it and what the Christian perspective is really all about. But you, you can't you can't throw any Bible and just sort of say um just the worldly narrative because a lot of what the world has, they got it from the church. When I consider the future professor, and I realize that the Bible says in the future that Israel shall be one of three nations that God will be speaking about highly, Egypt, Assyria, and Israel, and God calling Egypt my people, and Assyria my people, and Israel my people. I say, I wonder people just read them things, to understand that how on earth God reached there, you know, to call Egypt my people and Assyria my people. And everything in the Old Testament from the building of the temple, the first temple, God used unsaved people and put his spirit and filled them with his wisdom and caused them to be the ones, to be the specially anointed ones, to, to, to just to create the greatest thing that God called, you know, his own building. So when we forget that God knows where to find the people, I heard a question, put an answer in it. God knows where to find the people. He knows where to find the people who have the wisdom, who has the whatever it takes to lead. We had to pray that through. I am telling you plainly, brother, 
that God knows where they are. And some of them who are hiding will come out of their hiding if you allow this program to run for three sessions because the hour up already. And there's mm -hmm. so much that we have in our notes to share to let the people understand there is a Christian perspective. There is a Christian mm -hmm. perspective. But don't tell yourself that some of us are, who are pastors don't know a thing about it. We understand politics. We understand politics, we understand righteousness, and we understand everything else that is played out with a mask as though it is the right way. All I'm saying is this. Pro, allow us a little bit more time next time to, to build on this. People will be prepared more so to make contributions. Pastor Carlton, Armstrong, and myself, we were teenagers. Um, we got saved in the same church in Bethel Pentecostal many, many moons ago. So I'm telling you, um, <clears throat> we are old people like Jonathan Nelson and Rachel Beard and these guys who will all talk about kingdom and that kind of stuff. They're all gone now. Um, Miles Monroe, they're all gone. It's like they only leave me now by myself to, 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 to fight up together with Gary to convince the people, you know? And it's, it's hard, Professor, because few people understand what is a Christian perspective to building a nation. Those guys understood it, and I'm saying we have come with notes to make the people understand this is how this nation could be built. There's a template. This is how we could do things differently. There's a template, and we could do it like this as well. But you have answers as well, people out there, and it's not just about Christians. Like I said, in David's kingdom, most of those who were wrong, David, who were his leaders, we know the Bible, right? Our brother, young brother, is learning the Bible these days. But his greatest men, the greatest tree, and the first tree, and the second tree, and the, and the fourth tree, they were Gentiles, not Jews. And they were great in the kingdom of David. So we don't, we, we don't play as though we don't understand what is truth. We know God knows how to find them. And David's only point was this. If your heart is as my heart, in coming here with me, to join with me, to build God's kingdom, it has to be like my heart. And if your heart is like my heart, we could work together. And that's the only thing I believe is a good way as a note to end what I may want to say presently. That, uh, that's not from the notes, by the way. But you see that point? Go notify them. And David, if your heart like my heart, we could work together. Pro, the Lord knows where they are. They will come out of hiding. All right. Well, I see we, run, we have run out of time. So I will into... Uh, um... I will offer uh, uh, next week if you are willing to come back and continue the conversation, um, both of you gentlemen, and to come back because we we really haven't gotten into it. I, I don't think at the end of tonight we could identify what is the Christian perspective as yet. All right, so we need to get more into that. And so next week, Saturday, God's willing, we will be back again. And um, at the same time, I'm just going to give you gentlemen, you know, a, a minute you just to. Make some closing remarks. Maybe we could start with uh, Captain, retired Captain Griffith. Yeah, sure. Okay, so quickly, again, the the concept of politics, it, that, that actually has to do with everything related to the governance of a country. So that being the case, automatically it will mean now that, the, 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 that a church religion, it must be part, they must have a direct involvement in, in, um, in politics because it has to do with governing a country. And again, I have seen I have seen politicians be very cosmetic when it comes to religion. They attend every single service from every um, religious uh, aspect in the hope that they can get votes. They sometimes appoint person and say, "Listen, I have to appoint a Muslim to get the Muslim votes." And those, that's a cosmetic approach of politics. As it pertains to the to the church itself, I am I will insist that that the, there, there must be involvement. I have decided to bear my to bear that cross, and it is very difficult. I could have done the easy thing, but we need to find persons who are willing to do that. And if it is that we remember when it is you become a politician, what do you do? You swear on a Bible. So all Christians should hold the politicians accountable because if you have put your, your oath on something and you are breaching that oath, it is the right of us as as Christians to come and say, listen, we must hold you accountable. It is not for the for the that religious organization to show any major bias towards one party over another. But I think it is fair, um, it is fair game for persons in church 
to remind persons um, in the congregation, are you looking at politicians? Is he or she um, involved in hatred, in division, in trying to just arrest people illegally, in trying to divide the nation? Or is he or she somebody who really cares, who really wants to try to bring a country together, who's really trying to secure a country, serve a country? That must be involved in, in the church. So the church must definitely be involved just by one word, holding politicians accountable. Thank you. Pastor Brown, closing remarks. Yes, very, very short pro. Pro are not long like long time, okay? So that, that's a nice <laughs> part about getting old. Right now, pro, we are dealing with something called state failure versus state resilience. The state is failing. I have determined in myself to teach our people the truth, which involves leading and governing because of how wisdom is determined that if you're going to be full of her, she's going to bring you to glory, promote you, and cause you to govern. I teach that. So all I'm saying, bro, we have more of this to come. The people are going to share their parts, and I'm looking forward to you hitting us those hard questions, those bouncy balls. Well, yeah, I appreciate well, them. You know, you know, I was just bowling straight, straight tonight, right? The googlies <laughs> will come and the bouncers will come. You know, don't, don't you worry. So thank you so much. Thank you to yes, sir, Mr. Professor, Gary. If, if, yes. if you don't mind, um, there, there, we had a couple of WhatsApp messages um, that I, 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 I paused the pastor too much times that I couldn't. I could well, go right to, ahead. Go right ahead. Go but right I ahead. feel, let me try to put these in at the end here. And um, mm -hmm. I, I am also encouraging those that are listening uh, to, to remember, save your message somewhere that you could bring it back on, on when we come back. On the on on next week Saturday, so let me try to get some of these out. There was one person that says Trinidad Tobago is not a theocracy. What was uh, hold on? What was the mission of the New Testament church? Remember that these uh, strategies were used by the early church fathers, the early popes, Gregory, Clements, etc., attempted to merge church and state until blood in the Beatum and Lavantil is equivalent to blood in Valsain and, uh, and the homes of the politicians, there will be no justice. Redeem the most poor and sick first. Politicians are opportunistic, according to this person, and the church should teach the Bible, the people will choose right. This is coming out from someone in Texas. Uh, we have... Oh, we have a really long one here. I'm going to try to see how I can summarize it. Uh, somebody says, good night. Very interesting uh, program. I noted the mention of rebuilding the temple and the governmental structure according to God's standards. And the point that God knows where his people are, but we are, we are ready as Christians, ready to subject ourselves to one another because this was the successful structure of David's rule. There are those uh, God has given the graces to know the times and seasons and what to do. But do we wish to subject ourselves to such? Can we discern such? And they go on to give uh, two scriptures, 1 Chronicles 12, 32 and 38. And uh, they, they, they close off by saying the church really needs to come together and, and arise to show the earth and the nation the glory and the goodness of our everlasting and only true God. And this person is from TNT. Person says a breakdown, another person says, sorry, a breakdown of biblical standards equates to a breakdown of laws, political uh, laws and political agenda, etc. Uh, let me see if I could get somebody gives us gives us two scriptures here. Let's see if I could. Someone was asking the question: should the church have a political party? <laughs> Someone says uh, it's again a needful topic to be repeated with the absent panel. So they're looking for some others to join. Uh, and at this last one, I'll give someone says, Good evening to the panel. Mr. Gary Griffith, we call you Rambo, according to this person. Uh, I don't know, I don't know how you how you help who you we who live abroad would love to come and retire at home and enjoy a little of of all of the country. We need you as Rambo, please, according to this person. Um, 
so yeah, that, I, I tried to kind of give us some re of all, but a couple of messages. Well, we got this evening. Yeah, trying to figure out that Rambo thing, but um, okay. But gentlemen, thank you so much. 